Thank you, Tommy. That way you didn't have to listen to me sing because I'm not a singer. There's a lot of things I'm not, and a singer's one of them. Glad to see each one of you here tonight. I can hear myself. So, But uh, good crowd, good crowd. Y'all must not have knew I was coming. Anyway, um, let's take a stroll. Let's go down memory lane. How many of you can remember alpaca sweaters? How many of you can remember penny loafers? Um, how about a band lawn shirt? You ever heard of a band lawn shirt? That's some of the things that I grew up with that when I first came to Turberville was really different. Um, I was born in South Carolina but my father was in service. So we did a lot of traveling. I went to the first grade at the old schoolhouse, the old two-story schoolhouse that was over here. Fell a lot of times going up and down steps, had a bunch of splinters, a bunch of evidence that I went to school out there. Fat lot of floors will ruin your knees, I can tell you that. But um, we left after the first grade, and we didn't return until my father retired in 1964 when I was in the eighth grade. So I went from the eighth grade until I graduated at East Clarendon. But I missed a lot in between. But being stationed in another part of the country, it was kind of unique to me when I came back in the eighth grade. Because this was a little bit different place than where I had been before, and I had been in several places. But when I came back, it was interesting to see that there are things like high karate and old English um, and some of the clothes that I uh, named were things that, that people wanted. I mean, if you were in school and you didn't have penny loafers or you didn't have band lawns or alpacas or whatever, then you were different. You stood out in the crowd. Well, I stood out in the crowd because I was different. And what I learned very quickly was that the clothes that I was used to wearing, I couldn't even buy around here because everybody had alpaca sweaters, band line shirts. They had penny loafers. So you either bought what they had and wore it or you didn't hardly go to school during the new year. And I also noticed another thing. And that was there was a lot of peer pressure. You had a lot of people that were in little groups and you either fit in or you didn't fit in. And a lot of people did a lot of things to try to fit in with one group or another. And I got to thinking about that and I said, well, you know, it hadn't really changed a lot since then, other than instead of the things that I forementioned, people now are worried about electronics, what kind of phone you have, the number of a phone that you have, the computer that you have and who makes it. Um, kids are tied up with games, video games, where we used to love to get outside and get in trouble. Uh, now they stay inside and get in trouble. But uh, kids are kids. But we still have a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure on us from the outside to do all sorts of things. And there's a lot of people that continue to try to please and to fit in. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about tonight <clears throat> is people that try to please and people that try to fit in. Now, I was looking at my Bible today and I came to this place because of <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago I ran across some scripture. I was led to some scripture. And I read it and it really, it really touched me. It made me do a lot of thinking. So I decided whenever 
Um, I received the word today that <clears throat> I didn't know where Ryan would be tonight. And he didn't tell Tommy and I to flip a coin. I think he was tired of asking Tommy so much to fill in for him that he just sent me a message and told me to sent, sit in for him. Give Tommy a break too. <clears throat> but I was led to this scripture and I hope he's home. I hope that he's home safe. I pray that he is. I know that I was told this morning that he was traveling, that he had left, I guess, last night when his flight was canceling and was driving in. So that's a pretty good drive from Miami. So I'm sure that he is tired and probably resting. And I, like I said, I just pray that they had a safe trip and an ex, a speedy trip to get back home in time for him to do some resting. I'm sure that he's got a lot to tell us about. But the scripture that I was led to comes from John, the 12th chapter. And as I started in this chapter, it's a very busy chapter. There's a lot going on. Uh, to tell you where we're at in John's ministry, he's talking about Jesus, and we're about a week away from Jesus going to the cross. In fact, it starts off with... Um, six days before the Passover, which would be a little bit before uh, Jesus came into Jerusalem. And it talks about Martha. And it talks about Mary. And it talks about Lazarus. And it talks about them having supper. And I know you're familiar with that part of the story where uh, Martha got mad because Mary had taken the ointment and had anointed Jesus' feet and taking her hair and and Lazarus was in the group. And that's after he had died and had been risen again. And there was a a lot of people that even Julius Iscariot couldn't understand what Mary was doing. And he complained not because I guess of what she was doing but because of the money that was being wasted he felt like on Jesus' feet just pouring that expensive perfume out and Jesus had some wise things to say to him because he knew him and knew all about him and we proceed on to even in that chapter the people that came not only to see Jesus, but people came to see Lazarus. People had heard what Jesus had done and how Lazarus was alive again. So they came to see him and to see exactly what was going on with Jesus and his ministry. And then there were the chief priests and the other people that were there. And they didn't even want to stop at eliminating Jesus or killing Jesus, but with Lazarus' witness, they were even talking about killing Lazarus again. They were wanting to make sure that with so many people inquiring about him that, that he was also included and were in their plans to maybe even put him to death. And then we see Jesus' entry into Palm Sunday and riding the cold into Jerusalem and the fanfare that went on with it. And we saw people who were trying to get to Jesus, Greeks that were coming into town that wanted to spend some time with him and wanted to see him. And Jesus had some unique things to say especially in the latter part of this chapter. But it was very busy. It was a very busy time. It covered seven days, but it was a very busy seven days. I'd like to start the reading in verse 37. 
And it says, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He had blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah, when he saw his glory, and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, They did not confess him. Least they should have been put out of the synagogue. We're getting to the point and to the scripture where I was led. And what I see is a group of people from various backgrounds and with all kind of agendas. And I see the most religious group, not only was their agenda to do away with Jesus and Lazarus, but they wanted to continue to run and to rule and to save the religion that they loved. They were concerned. They were afraid that the position that they held was being threatened. And they weren't concerned as much about God as they were their position. And they were comfortable in their position. And because of that comfort and because of the power that they wielded, other people were afraid. Afraid to really let them or anyone else know how they really felt or what had happened in their life. The changes that had come about because of the things that they had been witness to. By the spirit that had moved in their life that was new and different. And how they were touched. A different touching. Something that they had never felt before. Something that was so special that it would spur someone to take a bottle of ointment that cost over $300 at that time and no, my, I don't have any idea how much it would cost now but to use it in a way that it wasn't even being designed to use but to anoint Jesus' feet with it. But we see that there was a lot of other things going on too. We see that something had changed in a lot of people. Not only for the good, but for the bad. We're told in verse 40 that their eyes had been blinded and their hearts had been hardened. That they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts. Because if they did, that they might be converted. That they might be changed. They might be healed. And there were those that were. There were those that had been changed. That's hearts had been touched, had been pierced. That believed. Even to a point that the same group that was trying to kill Jesus had many in it. 
that because of what they had seen and what they had been witness to, their life had been changed and touched. But here's where the peer pressure comes in. Peer pressure comes in because they were afraid. They were afraid if they let people know what had happened in their life that they wouldn't be accepted anymore. That the group that they had gone comfortable with and the group that they had wanted to be with and the group that they felt most comfortable and loved to be in would no longer accept them. Would no longer have anything to do with them. They would lose their position. They would lose their status. People would start walking around them. People would quit speaking to them. They were afraid that because of these wonderful things that had happened in their heart that they just really didn't know what to do. They were torn. And verse 42 says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But, but, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. You know, Jesus doesn't ask a lot of us. If you think of all that you owe him, the list is a little lopsided because he doesn't owe you a whole lot. But what you owe him would fill volumes. From the breath that you take every morning when you get up to being able to get up to each day that you spend that you're allowed to walk and to move on this earth to the opportunities that He affords you, to the things that you own and have that you're a steward of. But with everything that they owed Him, in their own minds it wasn't worth giving up that status and position. Peer pressure is hard. It's hard on everyone. And as much as we would like to think that it doesn't apply to us, I think that if we looked at even the things that we wore and the <clears throat> things that we drive, the things that we do, the places we go, have a lot to do with peer pressure. With what other people think. Verse 43, the latter verse 42, were the two verses that struck me the most. least they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. They cared more about what people thought about them than what God knew about them. They thought more about places that they wouldn't be able to go anymore than the love that God had shown them and the things that he had done in their life. I read these two verses and they've stuck with me for two weeks. I've tried to figure out 
how, if you could see all the miracles that Jesus did, that you could not acknowledge him and his works and his wonders. And then I think of all the miracles that he even does today that we get to see and that we get to witness. The baptisms that we have seen. People that have been saved. How big a blessing is it to be able to witness someone's life change? Or to see someone commit their life to Jesus and go through baptism. To look around and know that people that we have prayed for, their lives have changed. Sick people have been healed. All blessings that you have allowed to be part of. And yet even Tommy this morning had me thinking when he was talking about the things that we say on Sunday and then what we do on Monday. And I guess that led me back to these same two verses of Scripture. Where is your heart? Where is your love? Does that love show as much on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday when you're around a different group of people as it does when you walk in here on Sunday and on Wednesday? Do people out there look at you and by simply watching you and seeing you talk and the hearing what you have to say and watching you go about your daily tasks, know that you're different. Are they even interested? Do you even show them how much your love for God has changed your life? Do you take opportunity to remind people if it weren't for God where you'd be. He doesn't ask a lot. The only thing that he asks is that we would go out into the world and we do that on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. That when we go out into the world that we let people know about him. Is there no greater way to let people know about Jesus than in your routine and in the decisions that you make, the walk that you take, the things that you say when your Sunday crowd isn't around when you're around a different group of people. Do they know without a shadow of a doubt that there's something different about you? Something special. Something that they can't quite put their finger on. Do we recognize the opportunity when people look at us like that, that God has given us, that we could speak about Him, that we could tell people about Him, and about why we are the way we are, is because of Him and all that He's done for us. What kind of peer pressure are we under? Even the religious people 
had pressure on them. But they weren't willing to give up their status or their position because they were afraid of what other people might think of them. And I guess the biggest thing that I gathered out of it was at the end of the day, the only person that I really have to satisfy is the one that gave it all for me. Um, I learned and it took me a while to not worry a lot about what other people think and about what other people say. Because as long as I can lay my head down on my pillow at night and I can have a smile on my face knowing that I was blessed to have another day and to have opportunities to walk and to let people see a little of Jesus in me. It was a good day. I had been blessed. We have opportunities. There are a lot of people that are hurting. There are a lot of people that are different. There are a lot of people who have a lot going on in their lives. A lot of it bad. They need direction. Are we that light that Jesus talked about in this chapter? Are people seeing us and thinking how good it would be if my life was like that? What greater witness could we have all the other days of the week? If people could look at us and be so excited by what they saw that they wanted to know more about why we are the way we are. Sundays are special. God gave us this day to spend time with Him. To learn. To prepare us for Monday and Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. To help us to see those opportunities that we used to miss. To notice the people that aren't around us anymore. To notice those that are suffering. And those are sick. To see the needs. In our community. The needs that are all around us. You know we're taught that. As Christians we're supposed to be more like Jesus. And I think of all those opportunities. And I think of how Jesus would see things now if we could understand what he saw in people and the opportunities that we missed that he saw. Peer pressure is hard. It's still here. It applies to young and to old. It applies to Christians and it applies to people who don't even profess to know God. But one thing's for sure. That if Jesus has touched you, you're different. Whether you want to admit it or not, you're different. And while you're threatened in your groups, is because you can't hide it. 
People see it. And they know the difference. The only thing left for you to do is to be a witness. To not be afraid. And to do exactly what we were asked to do when Jesus hung on a tree for us to save us. That we might go out and that we might tell people that don't know about Jesus, about Him, and about what He's done for us. He didn't say we had to be a minister. He didn't say we had to be a missionary. He didn't say we had to teach the Bible. All he said we had to do was to make sure. To make sure that people knew about him. To tell people about Jesus. And about what he has done for us. You might be surprised. Jesus might take that group away from you. You might not be welcome in that group anymore. But the one thing that I found out about him is that he'll take those things away from you that you don't need. But he'll sure fill it with people that you do need. Real friends. Not just a group of People who say they're your friends. And I'll say this. When everybody else fails you, there's one who never will. He'll be there. Jesus couldn't even explain. Why so many people had such hard hearts and were so blind even as the light walked around them. What are you seeing? Where's your heart? Only you and Jesus know that. There's a lot of people that are suffering there's a lot of people we need to remember. I didn't call names this morning because there's too many. Too many people who have lost loved ones. Too many people who are hurting. Too many people who are sick. Too many people suffering. People's lives are changing around us every day. They need prayer. They need God. They need His touch. We have people in our church struggling, people who are having procedures. We need to remember all of them. God knows all of them. He knows every need that each one of them has. Is there anyone in particular that we need to remember tonight? Anyone that you can think of that we need to especially pray for? It seems like each day that we find out somebody different is either got the virus or is on quarantine or something else has happened that we didn't see coming or didn't expect. There's a lot to be prayed for. There's a lot that need prayer. We need prayer. 
Anyone in particular that you know of that you would like to mention tonight? Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is each time that we gather in your house as Christians, as believers, and have an opportunity to worship and to learn more about you. Father, how awesome it is to see even this number here because we realize that there are a lot of people that would be here if they could. But for whatever reason, they're not able to be here. So Father, we lift them up to you tonight because you ask us to. You ask us to look around and to pray one for another. So Father, we lift them up to you and we pray that you would work your wonderful will in their life. That you would continue to bless and to touch as only you can. That healing would take place. Whether it be in the heart or the absence of a loved one, or because of a disease or an affliction. We know that you can do both. That you can do all. So Father, as these needs are brought to you tonight, we just pray that you in your infinite wisdom would reach down and touch lives and make a difference. Father, tomorrow's Monday. We start a new week. Another opportunity. Another opportunity that you would bless us with to show people how great you are. To show you the joy you have put in our hearts Father that other people might see you in us Father that we might have opportunities to tell people about you and about what you mean to us and what you've done for us Father we thank you for your many and for your gracious blessings especially that you have bestowed upon this church and each family that is represented. Father, as we leave here and we face this week ahead of us, I just pray that you would be with us, would lead, guide, and direct us, show us the opportunities that you have put before us. That, Father, we might be blessed to do your will in this place. Bless us as we leave. Keep us safe. Bring us back. That we might praise and glorify you for all that you have allowed us to do and for the blessings that you have poured out upon us. And, Father, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In your precious and holy name we